Hello, everyone. My name is Joel Dart. As, as uh, Jed said, I come from, I live and work in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States. I work for a company called Dino, where we do real time classroom software. But tonight, I'm going to talk about people, the good parts. In JavaScript, the good parts, Papa Crockford, as he is affectionately called, said that JavaScript has an elegant core that shines through despite its share of bad parts. He used the book to, int to introduce a new generation to, this, to the virtues of this elegant core, and to introduce a tool called JSLint, where um, a tool designed to shine a developer's attention immediately on areas of the code that either will cause problems or could in time. Now, entire talks have been devoted to the good parts and the book's author and J.S. Lent, but I wanted to highlight what I find to be an interesting theme in all of this. One of the good parts that we all know and love is prototypal inheritance. Here, we're not able to only define the features and functionality of our objects, but also to extend existing objects by adding to their prototype. This has been used to extend the language and to prototype out language features and backport them into to older browsers. But it also serves as the basis for the very popular extends pattern that we see in a lot of our, our favorite um, frameworks. Here, you can take the properties and methods of one object and put them directly on another object, allowing for very powerful and simple means of multiple inheritance. Because you can take something that exists, something that's complete in itself, and extend it to new heights. This idea of extension has, has been um, embraced and complemented by the web development concept of progressive enhancement. As, as you know, here, we, take, we try to provide a complete user experience in HTML alone, and then provide incremental improvements to that UX using CSS and, finally, JavaScript. We take something complete in itself and extend it to new heights. But the web development community didn't create progressive enhancement. In fact, in the 1920s, film theorist and director Sergei Eisenstein discussed a theory of montage, where you would take one complete scene or, or, um, or image, and a second complete scene or image, and through juxtaposition, express a third new idea. But even before that, the great minds of ancient Greece, such as Pythagoras, discussed a system of music based on 12 tones and tetrachords. But they were not content only to pluck the lyre. So much so, in fact, they had a, a different system of musical notation for when the music was set against a text. Now, I don't speak Greek, but I'm told that the... Um, but I'm told that the music itself and the, the notation is, hold on, let me, real quick, change this. better? It's not any better, but it's okay. Apologize for this. <clears throat> not only that the rhythms itself are inspired by the language itself, to the point of the stresses, in the, the natural stresses in the language are, are found out in the notation. So they took, the, it was very clear because of this, they intended to take something complete in itself, the text, and extend it to new heights. My art project, Poetry JS, means to take, to continue in this tradition of progressive enhancement, this human tradition of extension. First, I take a text. This is not. Did 
Did I just break the projector? Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Once again, now we've got the full screen. <clears throat> All right, so I take, a, I take the text, such as this one here, that has its own theme and tone. Control is power, and I am in control of my life. This text itself is, comes from somebody who's very confident. I, I like to think of like an Alec Baldwin, Gordon Gecko, salesy type of guy. He's worked very hard in his life, and he's accomplished a lot of things, and probably worked maybe a little harder than those around him. And because of that, he has, feels a deep sense of pride about those outcomes. But now that I've got the text, I extend it with JavaScript semantics, syntax, and runtime. And here we can see the situation is much more complicated than the narrator originally thought. Now, this has a happy ending, or at least a non-crashing one. Um, as, as happy an ending as boring code could be. But a seasoned JavaScript developer is going to immediately recognize all the implied globals that are created, and the instability that adds to the program. Additionally, if you look a little closer, you can see one of the textbook examples of unexpected um, results from type coercion. What looks to be a very simple and obvious path forward has an unbelievable number of hidden powers at work. And this brings me to my first bad part of people, narrow vision. We, especially in the development community, are very intelligent people, aware of a broad range of subjects, and especially and aware also of even um, dangerous social vices such as pride. But for all our wisdom, we only know what we see, just like we wrote implied globals before we were taught implied globals. So we're arrogant, we're overconfident, but we are not alone. Our vision is weak, but it's supplemented by those who see what we cannot see. Now, no one likes to be called out, but the wounds of a friend can be trusted, even if it hurts your feelings. The second poem was actually my first, and probably still my favorite. It reads, functionality, let me zoom in a little bit. Functionality, variation one. I know my fate is undefined, hate destroys. Vile betrayals to regret, heart. I pray the vile betrayals are few, but dare I, while I take, continue healing, Lord. For this I know, and heart does break, what vile betrayals are my fate. I pray the Lord my soul to take, but dare ye not to take my hate. It's... Oh. It's a little emo. <laughs> it has a dark side to it. Um, the, the main narrator has a sense of regret about themselves and who they are and what they've done to people, um, similar to the Nine Inch Nails song, Hurt, or the Johnny Cash cover, if that's more your scene. Um, but the, still, there's a defiant resistance to change. The, the reasons aren't clear, but there's something that gets in the way of making things right. Now, when we look at, this, the, at the poem, um, I have a little fun uh, with uh, the function, turning that into functionality, and then var into variation. And then when we get back to the text itself, we can see I make a, a literary allusion, I pray the Lord my soul to take, from the children's nursery rhyme, Now I Lay Me. I bring this in for some cultural critique, but also to introduce the concept of a savior. But this isn't a redemption story, as the code itself reveals. Now, in the, this code is basically broken up into do, to two parts. The first part is exceptionally boring, just establishing variables and, and walking through the code. But the second part, actually, something interesting happens. We get ourselves into an infinite loop, one of the worst possible error states that we can be in. 
This has additional interest because of the way that the, the runtime interacts with the text below it. As we're in this infinite loop, we're stuck, constantly approaching healing, but never able to achieve it. So why do we get in this infinite loop? Well, because of the truthiness of I take. I is just a config object passed into the function but dare, um, which is called at the bottom. But dare is um, basically just passes through the properties from the my variable, which is defined up at the top as a simple object literal with two own properties, fate, which is undefined, and hate, which is a string, destroys. So we're in this infinite loop because of the existence of the own property hate. But what's interesting about that own property is that it shadows the clean prototype underneath it. If we were to have a simple delete statement before calling but dare, then the prototype would shine through, and we would never be in this situation. But the program is written. There is no delete, and we're stuck looping forever. But looking back to this relationship, there's something about this relationship between own properties and prototypes. The prototype is the platonic ideal, and the own properties as the things that get in the way of who we can really be, the things we have to let go. This next poem is called Art and Fear. It goes, when it happens, when it happens. <laughs> who sees what this program does? All together now, it does nothing. We see, we can't help but see the infinite recursion and the peril to any pr person who dares call this code. But the reality, the reality of it is, as ominous as this code is, it's harmless. The program is written. <laughs> Imposter syndrome is surprisingly rampant in our community. If they only knew how little I know, they'd fire me on the spot, right? <laughs> but um, this, this um, is titled Art and Fear because of a book with the same title about the troubles and identity issues in the art community. It's very useful for an artist, but I recommend it for programmers as well. In the book, one of the interesting observations of the author is that how odd it is that an artist can make art and still doubt themselves as an artist. If we were to watch this code in Internet Explorer 10, and I believe some other engines as well, um, we would see another interesting output. Because IE10 has an interesting runtime, a runtime optimization called delayed compilation, whereby programs aren't even com functions aren't even compiled until their first invocation, which means not only does this, this code not matter enough to devote ex execution cycles, it doesn't even turn it into machine code. What an amazing optimization to see things for how they really are. <laughs> but still, with, with the truth out there, why is it that we let fear get, be one of the things that prevents us from being who we can really be? And the problem with imposter syndrome is that to beat it, you have to convince yourself that you're wrong. Which brings me to my next bad part. We're obstinate. We don't like change, even when we know, know what to do. It's, it's not only the bullheaded trope from the first poem, Variation 1. Sometimes it's the more vulnerable imposter syndrome. But in either case, we don't like to make changes on our own. We need others to encourage us and to hold us accountable. By all means, be the change you want to see in the world. But think back, the, re the main reason why people volunteer is because someone asked them to. That's right, I forgot to zoom in. All right, this last, this last work that I wanted to share with you is a children's story that I wrote named Little Coder. When I decided I wanted to write a children's story, I knew it needed to be exciting, so I decided to highlight the most heroic of JavaScript's language features, hoisting. Honestly, 
When you see some code and you're reading through it, it's like, oh no, this isn't going to work. And then it totally does because of hoisting. It, to me at least, it feels like it swoops in there at the last moment to save the day. That's excitement, that's adventure, that's hoisting. <laughs> so here's the poem. Yes, hoisting for all. Now, the, the poem itself is wrapped in an iffy like most of our programs are where here I'm able to pass a special message to my daughter, disguised as the dedication slash the end structure. And then after that, it's built in three paragraphs and a dangerous forest of hoisted variables. And I played with the white space a little to give it this uneasy, cramped feeling as you're walking down the path. Um, so with that, it reads, Little coder, on your way. Much advice, will people say, for performance, teamwork, or to make more clear, don't let your imagination gray. And all this advice is truly good, though it's often misunderstood, for all that comes out of love deserves respect, as it should. But you must fight. Avoid a yawn. Statements to build function on must state the truth that lives in you before the you in here is gone. So when we take a look at the, at the poem itself, um, first thing I do is make a cultural illusion up here in For Performance, where you can see the very first piece of JavaScript performance advice you ever received to cache your, um, your length in your variables, or in, in a for loop. Then additionally, later on, there's some word painting with you in here, and then above that comes out of love as love kind of bubbles out of itself. But other than that, and the hoisting, this is really much more about the message itself which is good because I feel that it's kind of an important message. In the poem, it's, or in the, in the story, it's basically some advice you would give to a programmer who's starting out. To, that there's going to be all this advice, and you need to take it and respect it, but in the end, you have to choose your own path. But in this, I believe that there's a relatively controversial challenge, a judgment lint, if you will, to take all the advice you're given and try to find the author's love in it. See, you can call J.S. Lint paternalistic, and it is paternalistic, but he wrote it because he honestly wanted to help people avoid the pain from those errors. And the same thing goes for those who rail against paternalism. They want people to be able to make their own choices and their own trade-offs and to not lose the power in the language. Ember people feel that a really curated happy path is going to make web development easier. Microlibrary feel that choice is what makes web development easier. They're putting their opinions out there because they care. So respect, right? You can find your own path and still respect those who pointed you in a different direction. But these di different directions should also be celebrated. Diversity of thought and newly explored avenues have stretched the boundaries of humanity. We create, and we reinvent, and we disagree, but the pursuit benefits us all. The commons we enjoy today are built off of the, those creating the commons before us. The other really interesting and defining feature of hoisting is the inherent rising motion. We have so many heroes in the JavaScript community. Some provide ideas, others energy and time organizing, others code, but we all rise with their tide. So my question to you is, do you see the good parts? JavaScript was written with a really tiny standard library. No string interpolation or extends or, um, or contains. No array, insert, or map. And as we've discussed, we ourselves are also pretty limited, lacking in vision, in confidence, in humility. And I'm pretty sure we all have our own special missing radix feature. So where are these good parts? Well, despite its standard library, JavaScript was written to be incredibly extensible to allow the community to fill in the rest. And from that, the community has extended it to heights I don't think any of us had dreamed. And one of the defining features of our primate tribe is the fact that we have tribes. We've seen not only that there is safety in numbers, but in our language, our art, all our best ideas from democracy to open source to the internet, they all seem to echo the redemption story that I'm not the best person I can be on my best day but when I'm extended. And so if I have one parting challenge for you, it's to always be looking for the good parts in others. Allow yourself to be hoisted by the best in your neighbors and try to mix in when you can. 
When I look back at what, what attracted me to this language, I always joke that it was the unicorns and pirates that sold me. But here is a community. Thank you.